controversy brewing over Palm Beach County this weekend as a shark fishing tournament has been organized by local fishermen, sparking outrage by wildlife activists. Though so globally, sharks are being decimated. Anglers claim here in Florida the shark population is thriving. This is a 100% legal event, and we followed all the rules and regulations, and by uh, the number of boats that were stopped by FWC today, it looks like all our fishermen followed all the rules and regulations as well. The fishermen on this boat were caught beating a protected sandbar shark. Harvesting them is illegal in Florida. So is dragging a shark until it dies. We drove this fish for two hours. It so wasn't bad. The whole thing of, <clears throat> of the tournament of us going out there and you know having an okay corral out there with sharks is not the case at all. What I witnessed was exactly what I expected. People excited to kill animals for no reason, <laughs> spreading lies about the number of sharks out there. Keep going. We are starting to get to the point uh, where there's an imbalance, where there's a, a there's a little bit too many sharks at the moment. While fishermen and charter boat captains say that they believe just from observation that there are more sharks in the water than ever before, marine biologists say that that is biologically impossible. There is no baby shark boom. Shark populations have declined by 70 to 90 percent worldwide, depending on the species. 18 shark species are listed as endangered, and most of them are dying for one thing, soup. More specifically, soup made from shark fins. There's a worldwide collapse of sharks, and this is going to turn our, our beautiful oceans into a vast, uh, empty ocean of just jellyfish. Sharks are arguably the most captivating animals on the planet. No animal was able to capture pure fascination and fear as much as sharks. Their hunting strategies leave us in awe, and the way they slowly glide through the water is majestic enough to grab anyone's attention. Sharks may be the most captivating animal, but they also might be the most hunted. If I were to ask you how many sharks you thought were killed each year, how many would you say? For those that don't know about the horrors of shark fishing in the fin trade, you might guess a couple hundred thousand, or maybe even a few million. But if you guessed anything less than 100 million sharks, you are wrong. Animal cruelty and poaching is no stranger to mankind. It can be seen almost everywhere you go, whether it's the killing of rhinos in Africa or jaguars in South America. But what about sharks? Where are sharks being killed? The killing of sharks is something that happens worldwide, every single day, and it happens for a variety of reasons. Most people believe that shark fins are the only reason they're killed, but in reality, sharks are also killed for cartilage pills, their liver oils are used by cosmetic companies around the world, and they're even used as trophies in shark fishing tournaments. Looking past how many sharks are killed each year, the methods in which we do this are even more terrifying, and by all accounts, barbaric. Since the year 2000, roughly 2 billion sharks have been killed. And to put that number into perspective, upwards of 274,000 sharks are killed every single day, and 11,000 an hour. So why do we do this? Why do we kill so many sharks year after year? And how do we protect sharks for the future? I've wondered all of these questions my entire life, and in this documentary, I'm going to try to answer all of them. But one of the biggest problems is that people don't understand why sharks are important and why they're necessary for the ocean. Sharks are a difficult subject because of the idea that they're mindless man-eaters, but in reality, this couldn't be further from the truth. And to help me explain all of this to you, I enlisted the help of one of the most world-renowned underwater cinematographers, Jonathan Bird. Sharks serve a really important role in the ecosystem. In any ecosystem, you need a top predator because the top predator keeps everybody else in line. You know, it's, whether you're a lion out in the Serengeti or you're a shark swimming around a reef, they've actually done studies 
on the interaction between sharks and the health of marine ecosystems. And I can give you a really good example. So on a typical coral reef, you have a couple of different trophic levels. So you've got these little herbivore fish that go around eating the algae. And those fish are really important because they keep the algae from overgrowing the coral. So if you want the coral to be healthy, you can't let it get overgrown by algae. So these fish are going around like eating the algae. And then there's the next fish up and that's like the groupers. And so the, the groupers and stuff are going after these smaller fish. You don't want too many of those middle fish because if there's too many of them, they eat too many of the herbivores and then you get algae, right? So you got to keep everybody in balance. If you take the sharks out of the ecosystem, if you overfish the sharks, what happens is you get too many of the middle fish and then they eat too many of the lower level herbivores and then algae takes over the reef. And so basically you can see a direct correlation between overfishing sharks and the reefs becoming unhealthy. He's exactly right. If you take sharks out of the equation, an environment like a coral reef will completely collapse. The effects of decreased shark populations can be felt in every ocean environment because without an apex predator, it all goes sideways. And possible shark extinctions would affect us too. A lot of our fisheries would collapse, messing up our entire food supply. And once you mess with that, the stability of society begins to fall into question. When you take all of this into account, it's easy to see why sharks are needed. The ocean needs a healthy shark population in order to survive. So if we're able to clearly see that sharks are needed, then why are they still killed? When it comes to killing sharks, there's only one real starting point, and that is shark finning. But sharks will never be mistaken for big-eyed baby seals or even friendly dolphins. So there's been no public outrage about what surely constitutes a worldwide slaughter. About 100 million sharks a year are killed by humans. Shark populations have declined by 70 to 90 percent worldwide, depending on the species. 18 shark species are listed as endangered, and most of them are dying for one thing, soup. More specifically, soup made from shark fins. Shark finning is a rather uh, distasteful practice uh, where sharks are caught basically just for their fins um, because there's no use for the rest of the animal. So, you know, they'll be caught and brought on the boat or whatever and just have their fins chopped off. And then because they don't want to deal with, you know, a bunch of dead sharks, they just throw the shark back. So it's obviously kind of wasteful. I mean, if you're going to fish for an animal, um, might as well at least use the whole animal. Shark finning is one of, if not the most cruel and wasteful practice that we do. In most cases, the fishermen are only using 5% of the shark's body before being thrown overboard to eventually drown. Something like this has to be used for something important in society right? Well, that isn't really the case. Around 100 million sharks are killed each year for soup. Shark fin soup is a Chinese delicacy dating back to the Ming Dynasty, and it's something that's been woven into the fabric of a lot of Asian societies. At one point in time, shark fin soup was the most expensive soup in the world, and even though its price has dropped in recent years, it remains a way to show high social status throughout all of Asia. It, it, like it used to be like a long time ago, shark fins were hard to come by and so therefore they were very expensive. And so if you were serving shark fin soup, it's sort of like fancy, you know what I mean? It's like if you served caviar at your party, like you're fancy. And so it's sort of like, oh, I'm high class. I'm serving shark fin soup. But nowadays with the type of fishing that's being done, it's, it's not expensive and yet it's still considered high end. There's this huge demand for shark fins just so that people can have the impression of being like high class. For something so high class, it should be one of the most desirable and tasteful soups in the world, right? Well, that isn't the case here either, as shark fins actually add no noticeable flavor to the soup. What they do is they dry the fins and then they have these um, cartilaginous strands in them that, you know, sharks don't have skeletons made of bone, they have cartilage. And so they have these, these strands and when they 
when they later make the soup, what they do is they cook the fin for a really long time, like six hours, and it breaks down into these little strands of cartilage, and they look like noodles. They put them in a chicken-based broth, and it's literally chicken noodle soup, except with shark fin cartilage strands for noodles, and it doesn't taste like anything. It tastes like chicken. Like, it's completely pointless. And you know, if you want chicken noodle soup, just use noodles. Like, they taste better, actually. The shark fins are added to the soup purely for texture. So why won't people switch to eating something else? Well, there's a few different factors that go into it. First is the social status that we touched on. Eating shark fin soup makes you seem like one of the higher ups. But there's also the generational issue. Shark fin soup is thousands of years old, and it's something that's been consumed in every generation. People are learning from their parents and grandparents that eating shark fin soup is important for their culture. Therefore, they have to continue eating it. I mean, when it all comes down to it, for shark fin soup to become out of fashion, people have to stop buying it. Looking to the businesses themselves will never work because there's too much money involved. The powers behind the shark fin trade are enormous. Killing sharks is a billion dollar industry altogether. And when there's that much money involved, people won't give that up for anything. And the thing is, all of these multi-million dollar businesses know what they're doing is wrong. They do everything they can to hide and cover up what they're doing. And to their best ability, stop any videos or evidence of how they conduct business from getting out. It gets so dark that there's stories of conservationists disappearing after investigating shark finning vessels. Once you start meddling with their profits, it all goes sideways. Another problem with the fin trade is the generalized view that it's only China, or China is the issue, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Even though China is one of the worst countries when it comes to shark finning, this practice happens everywhere. According to a report from The Guardian, Europe accounts for nearly half of exported fins worldwide, while countries like Costa Rica, Indonesia, Spain, Mexico, and Nigeria all play a massive role. The city of Hong Kong may be the central hub for shark finning, but it's a global issue. One thing that stands out is that the United States is one of the biggest exporters for shark fins. How could a country that outlaws shark finning in their waters still be exporting them? Back in 2016, the US passed the Shark Fin Trade Elimination Act, which banned the trade of shark fins throughout the country. However, despite this, shark fins can still be bought and sold throughout the United States. With areas like Europe and North America still participating in the shark fin trade, you can begin to understand how widespread of an issue issue shark finning really is. The one thing about shark finning is that no matter what your stance is on sharks, it's hard to watch. In most cases, the fins are cut off at sea, and the shark is thrown back into the ocean to slowly drown. It's disgusting, it's barbaric, and it's leading to the destruction of our oceans, and it's tough to think that it's all happening just for a soup. It can be so easy to point to shark finning as the only reason why sharks are quickly racing towards extinction. And even though it remains their top threat, the issue of shark fishing goes so far beyond this. The killing of sharks isn't only for a Chinese delicacy, but it's for moisturizers, face creams, and cosmetic products around the globe. Shark cartilage pills can be found on sites like Amazon, and shark liver oil labeled as squalene is used for cosmetics. Shark squalene is used in anti-aging creams, lotions, deodorants, lipstick, and more. These are products that a lot of you may have used before watching this documentary, and you might be using shark liver oil without even knowing it. Right now, I am pulling into my local grocery store here in Kansas City, Missouri, around 800 miles away from the closest ocean. So this should be a place that's free of shark products, but we're about to find out. I decided to take a trip to my local grocery and retail stores because I wanted to see how commonly shark squalling could be found, and I, I was shocked to find it inside products. After visiting three different stores, my findings were conclusive. I was able to find shark squalene being used in a few different products, which goes to show how big of an issue it really is. It's taken me a little while of looking, but I found a shark product. Squalene right there. The use of shark liver oils inside products was a massive issue 10 plus years ago, but due to increasing pressure, a lot of companies have switched away from it. But clearly, not all. 
Now some of you out there might know that there's two forms of squalling. One version spelled with an E and one spelled with an A. Most products use squalane with an A, and it's common belief that this version is only derived from plants. However, this isn't always the case. Squalane with an A is a saturated form of squalene with an E, and it's more commonly used in personal care products. A search on the company's website confirms that this was not sourced from plants. Now, it might start to become understandable if this ingredient had magical healing powers, but in reality, it doesn't. And the most frustrating part is that there is a better, and by all accounts cheaper, plant alternate to shark squalene. Sharks are also killed for cartilage pills. These can be found on websites like Amazon, eBay, and more, and are often sold inside vitamin stores. Now, if it's sold as a vitamin, it should be good for you, right? That just isn't the case. Multiple studies have found that shark cartilage pills actually inflame your joints and don't help your body's health at all. The main takeaway with all of this is that the killing of sharks isn't something that only happens in faraway places. It can be felt in your own city. Whether it's shark finning or cartilage pills, the killing of sharks hasn't shown any real benefits to society, which is the most baffling part about all of this. We're killing sharks at unprecedented rates for luxuries and delicacies. Now, in all of the previous cases, sharks were killed for something. They are killed for a product or something that we can consume. But why would a shark be killed? in the United States. Shark fins can still be sold and transported throughout the United States, but thankfully shark finning is illegal in the surrounding waters, but that doesn't necessarily mean sharks are safe in US waters. Like scenes straight out of the movie Jaws, the US has a big problem when it comes to sharks, and it's something that can be seen all throughout the country. getting reaction to that controversial fishing tournament in Palm Beach County last weekend targeting one of the ocean's top predators. Nearly a dozen bull sharks killed in a contest to see who could catch the biggest. But taking away these apex animals can have a huge negative impact on our oceans. Still, it was all perfectly legal. And we have to warn you, the images you're about to see are very disturbing. Here's tonight's Don't Trash Our Treasure. <laughs> This is the aftermath of last weekend's shark fishing tournament off the coast of Palm Beach County. 11 mature bull sharks hunted and killed in the name of science. We are starting to get to the point uh, where there's an imbalance, where there's a, a, there's a little bit too many sharks at the moment. Robert Navarro is one of the organizers, a sports fishing contest promoter who happens to sit on NOAA's Atlantic Highly Migratory Species Advisory Panel. Navarro says this tournament was needed. The tournament rules adhere to Florida law. Anglers could only legally harvest bull sharks, one per person, two per boat, whatever is less. But was this really only about science? Ryan Walton is one of many activists with eyes on the water during the tournament, making sure everyone played by the rules. But the fishermen on this boat were caught beating a protected sandbar shark. Harvesting them is illegal in Florida. So is dragging a shark until it dies. These things are not made to die. We drug this fish for two hours. It still wasn't bad. Since the pandemic, Florida now has a record-breaking one million plus registered boats. There was a major boom in recreational fishing pressure. And that combination there is creating you know, some of these heightened interactions. Uh, it's very difficult to say how many sharks are out there. This should serve as a wake-up call to all who care. The ocean. Shark fishing tournaments are something that happen every single weekend throughout the summer in the United States, whether it's the annual Alabama fishing tournament or ones organized like the Jupiter Florida tournament. It's constantly happening. These tournaments often reward the largest shark catches with cash prizes, trophies, and more. It kills me that we're, we're still doing this. You talk about barbaric. I, I went to, I was uh, hired to shoot a shark fishing tournament about 15 years ago for a documentary that was being made for a National Geographic channel, I think. And uh, I, I just couldn't believe that we still do this. Like you're a he-man because you went out in your boat and you caught a shark and you come back 
and you hang it up and weigh it and you win if it's the biggest shark and then they don't know what to do with the shark because nobody wants to eat the shark meat so they cut the fins off and they sell those and they throw the thing dead away in a dumpster like really it's disgusting it's horror it's revolting why do people do this the best example of the problem with shark fishing tournaments can be seen with what happened down in jupiter florida and it's not just the fact that they were killing sharks, it's also the methods they used to do it. Whether it's gunshots, drowning, or the method of dragging the shark until it dies, it's all barbaric. Fishermen organized this tournament with the sole purpose of knocking down shark populations as much as possible, claiming it was to restore balance. Scientific facts and research show this to be the opposite. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, sharks are not overpopulated. In this tournament, was done out of spite. This is a cultural issue we have not only around the world, but in the United States. A lot of the public feels the need to host shark fishing tournaments, and little action is done to stop these, even by wildlife protection programs. When I was a kid, I liked to go fishing. I liked, I, I, you know, at the local lake, I liked to catch a bass because I thought it was fun to try to catch a bass. I never caught much. I'm, I'm a terrible fisherman, but I would always let the fish go because I don't want to eat the fish. I don't want to kill the fish. I just wanted to take a picture, prove that I caught the fish. Look, I caught a fish and then I let it go and the fish goes back to its life. And I don't see why, we, if you got to do shark fishing tournaments, like if you really want to catch a shark, I could be I could be okay with it if it's catch and release fishing. If you're gonna let the shark go, we're not at a point now where there's any place in the world where there's enough sharks that we should be fishing them. And as, as you know, sharks have extremely low fecundity. They are uh, they 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 don't have many pups, and they take a long time to reach sexual maturity. So they they can make some pups. So you can't you know they don't rebound quickly from overfishing. As you read down the list of problems with shark tournaments, one of the things that stands out is who sponsors them. The 89th annual Alabama Shark Tournament that happened this year was sponsored by big name companies like Academy Outdoor, Coca-Cola, and Chevy amongst others. How can such big name companies support tournaments like this? When you walk up to one of these tournaments and see that it's sponsored by something like Coca-Cola, you get it in your head that there is nothing wrong with these tournaments. So that raises the question, why do so many people have so few problems with shark tournaments? Sharks being cast in a negative way is something that's been woven into American culture. And even though it gets better day by day, it's still a large issue. Watching protests about these tournaments, one thing is clear. The majority of people protesting the tournaments are young. Watching all of the footage, you see a lot of 20 and 30 year olds, but the older populations become a little more scarce. But why is that? Most of the fishermen in these tournaments are around the age of 40 or over. You could say that it's because society today has a much better impression of sharks, which is definitely part of it. But what else is a factor? Now, if you flash back to the 1970s, the US took a massive shift when it came to its view on sharks. And there's only one thing that could have caused that. That is the blockbuster movie, Jaws. There is a creature alive today. It lives to kill. A mindless eating machine. It is as if God created the devil and gave him Jaws. We can all name this movie just off the music, as Jaws is one of the most iconic movies ever made. Steven Spielberg's masterpiece on science fiction horror has left a big imprint on society, but maybe not the best one. You're gonna need a bigger boat. A mindless eating machine, says one of the trailers for Jaws. This film left every moviegoer a little more afraid to step back into the ocean. Thus introducing the Jaws generation, a term coined off the people who were alive when Jaws was released. And this includes a lot of the fishermen we see in these tournaments. So the question is, how big of an impact did Jaws really have on our society? So Peter Benchley didn't do sharks any favors with that yeah. with his book um which then became a movie and uh steven spielberg can take some credit for this too because he made a really scary movie out yeah. of a pretty scary book um honestly i i met peter benchley later in his life and 
he felt bad about that movie. You know, he never meant to demonize sharks. The guy just wanted to write a good story that scared people and you needed a monster. There is no question that film was unbelievably, unbelievably influential in my generation. I mean, if you saw that in movie in the theater, it was a scary movie, man. It made you really, really afraid of the ocean. And yes, there is a generation of people who are deeply affected by that film. After its release, Jaws definitely had a big impact on society. Every shark attack that followed put the soundtrack into people's minds. But is it still a factor today? Jaws undoubtedly scarred an entire generation. But the movie doesn't have the same effect on the younger generations because, well, they weren't there to witness it. However, that doesn't mean Jaws still isn't a factor. This movie helped create a nationwide fear and misunderstanding of sharks that can still be seen today. A lot of people look at sharks as unintelligent, dull, and a nuisance for our oceans. You look around at the people participating in these shark tournaments, and their faces are full of smiles, even though their motives are full of ignorance. And it's not just Jaws that helped create this nationwide misunderstanding of sharks. News outlets and social media have helped propel this issue even further. Just take a look at the way sharks are covered by national news stations and the way in which they talk about these animals. Sharks kill. Everyone knows that. We hear about it all the time. There was a deadly shark attack on Cape Cod. Deadly shark attack along the central coast. Charter boat captains say that they believe just from observation that there are more sharks in the water than ever before. Marine biologists say that that is biologically impossible. There is no baby shark boom. <laughs> it's good to know there's no baby shark boom now. It's good to know. Thank you, Carrie. But the shark came at me again. Another kick and the creature backs off. You're okay, Steven, you're okay. I swim back to the boat. Luckily, all in one piece. After seeing all of this, it becomes clear that unless you're a diver or shark enthusiast, it's hard not to fall under the common view of sharks. With how much influence there is from social media and the news these days, it's hard for people to truly understand sharks. The idea that sharks are man-eaters is something that we need to push out of society. The more and more you show people educational programs about sharks and them in their natural habitat, the more people start to understand them. So a couple of days ago, you know, we put out a question on our community page and, and I really was genuinely curious. I wanted to hear from our fan base about what um, effect they felt Blue World had on them. And within 24 hours, we had almost 250 comments uh, from our viewers. And I would say 25% of them said that the show taught me to appreciate sharks and that I'm not as afraid of sharks anymore. And I understand now why sharks are important. I think that's empirical evidence that just maybe watching a documentary or watching a YouTube show or maybe going to an IMAX movie and, and really seeing something well-produced that presents sharks in a positive light and shows what they do and how they're important does make an impact on people, especially younger people. I think that the, the people that are more afraid of sharks are the, the people that grew up with this you know, this, the media telling us that they're bad. You know, if you hang around wild animals or even domesticated animals, you know, every once in a while, there's going to be an accident. And you can't, you can't look to one, if one isolated event and say, oh, sharks are bad. I mean, come on. There are thousands of successful, fun, completely safe shark dives that are conducted every day, probably. I mean, certainly every week, all year around, all around the world. And these, these shark dives show that sharks are just, they're just fish, man. We're continuing to push negative reports and programs about sharks out of the way. And the more we do this, the more sharks will be adored. One positive we do see is that the younger generations are less fearful of sharks, but there's always more work to be done. 
So how can we get rid of shark fishing tournaments? The only way we can do this is by turning to the lawmakers and making sure our voice is heard. The more regulations and protections we put onto sharks, the quicker these tournaments will disappear. Another issue shark fishing in the US represents is the wrongful labeling of food. Believe it or not, in places like Florida, South Carolina, and more, shark meat is sold inside a lot of grocery stores. This meat is often mislabeled as Atlantic whitefish and rockfish. The problem with shark fishing never seem to end, and until we get these messages across to everyone, it won't stop. Protecting sharks is a steep uphill challenge, but it can be completed. Now, everything I've covered so far has been a problem, whether it's shark finning or the tournaments that happen in the US. But what about the solutions? How can we fix all of these problems? As I touched on, the biggest issue facing sharks is finning. Over 100 million sharks are killed every year just for their fins. And if that isn't unsustainable enough, millions more are killed for cosmetic and health products around the world. When it comes down to it, the only way we can stop sharks from being killed is to stop buying shark products. We need to make eating shark fin soup socially out of fashion, and we need to stop buying from companies like Aveeno and Vimerson Health. As I touched on, it's all about the money, and the minute that these companies start losing revenue is the minute we'll actually see a change. But at the same time, we need to push for lawmakers to make a change and protect sharks. We've already seen tremendous progress in places like the Bahamas and Hawaii, which are both shark sanctuaries, but we need to protect other places. But there's still one issue you left on the table. What about the fishermen? It's a great counterpoint to shark fishing because you simply can't blame a lot of the fishermen that are doing this because in a lot of cases it is their only way to make money and it's their only way to support their family and the second you take away shark fishing their revenue disappears. Well, there's two solutions to this. The first and probably most beneficial one is to transition them to shark tourism. This industry is so much more profitable than shark killing. As a fact, a dead shark is worth around $30 USD around the world. And then the live shark in the Bahamas can bring in up to $250,000 throughout the course of its life. Is that enough money? A few years ago, we were going down to Mexico to film bull sharks in, in Riviera Maya and uh, with phantom divers, they do this great bull shark thing. So the bull sharks go in the winter time, the females go to this one area to have their pups. And it's only about a two month window. And we went down there to make an episode about it. And we got there and uh, Jorge says to us, well, I got good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is that like last week, the shark fishermen came and caught all the sharks. And the good news is uh, there's still a couple around. And the fact of the matter is that I don't know what those sharks were worth as fins, but nowhere near what they were worth as revenue to the region for all of the divers and the tourists that came to see them. There's so many examples of this transition being successful. The beach town of Cabo Plomo, Mexico used to be a hub for shark finning. Since then, they have transitioned into a shark tourist hotspot, where they offer daily dives with these animals. The town's revenue has almost tripled since the change, and they are living their best lives. The second way is to educate them that if there are more protected areas for sharks, and all fish for that matter, then their fishing yields will be better. I think the only way that you ever can get fishermen on your side is to present a business case to convince them that business will be better if they do something in a different way. You have these nonprofit organizations that go into places like say the Philippines or Indonesia, where you have local fishermen that are subsistence fishermen and they're, they're just trying to catch enough fish to feed the, the, vill the local village and they've got reefs that are completely fished out because they have a limited range and they just fish them all out. And then the nonprofit says, listen, if you create a non, uh, a protected area where there's no fishing allowed, a small area, it doesn't have to be huge, could be a football field or two worth right. of, of, of reef. And if you don't allow fishing there, if you give it a couple of years, you you will be shocked, like 
how well that area will give you more fish around the whole area because it'll fill up with fish because they're protected in there and then it'll overflow into the surrounding reefs and then eventually you'll have like a waterfall of fish that you can you can catch without affecting the protected area i don't eat fish i don't eat seafood i'm a fisher friends not food kind of guy um, I feel, I, I like to say I have a professional relationship with the marine life. I don't eat them, they don't eat me, it's all good. Yeah. Um, but in other parts of the world, people don't have that choice. There are countries where the primary source of protein is seafood, plain and simple. Um, and if they don't have seafood, they don't have protein. So you can't say to them, you guys can't eat fish, what are you crazy? So they have to eat some fish. And so you have to make it sustainable. And the only way that it becomes sustainable is to figure out a way to make it sustainable. And then more importantly, to convince the fishermen to go along with it. And when it comes to shark fishing tournaments in the US, the solution is pretty easy. We just need to continue to put pressure on lawmakers as well as educate the public about sharks. These animals are so much smarter than we can even comprehend, as well as complex, social, and of course, majestic. And you know, I'm on the record of saying that I think sharks are a lot smarter than people realize. Yeah. Um, sharks can learn very quickly. When we, when we did the episode where we put the GoPro on the tiger shark and the shark swam around, did a lap of the reef and came back and shook it off right at our feet, that was not an accident. I mean, that is a shark that knows the deal. Like that shark's been around the block. Um, they're not dumb at all. Um, so, and people say, well, how smart are they? Well, I don't know. Like, are they as smart as a dog? Like, I, like, I don't know, but they're definitely, they're smarter than your average fish. Sharks have been on our planet for over 400 million years. There's over 450 known species of them. They display some of the most complex social and hunting behaviors anywhere in the animal kingdom. And they are vital for not only our oceans, but our planet. You know, 100 years ago, we were killing whales almost to the point of extinction. But we were able to come together as a species to help protect these animals. But why can't we do that with sharks? We were looking at our behavior against whales as barbaric and unnecessary. We were asking ourselves, why were we doing this? But why can't we get to that point with sharks? They might not be as easy to love, but they're more important for the survival of our oceans. It's hard to imagine what some of these sharks go through to be killed. Whether it's being dragged by a boat for four hours until it dies, or having all of its fins cut off and being thrown back to drown. It's disturbing to think about. My goal with this documentary wasn't to get you to donate to organizations or go on a rant online about shark protections, it was to get you to care. So much of the world turns its back to not only sharks, but all animal cruelty. And my message is, don't turn away. Fight for those who can't fight for themselves. If you see an image or video online that you don't like because of how inhumane it is, don't turn a blind eye to it. If it bothers you, do something about it, take action, and most importantly, do it for our future generations. It might be hard for some of us to understand, but 50 years from now, it might be nearly impossible to see a shark in the wild. Choose conservation over luxury, choose protection over trophies, and choose knowledge over ignorance. We like to think we're continuously evolving as a species, but when you see stuff like this, it makes it seem like we're stuck. Whether or not you want to believe it, Earth is a utopia. We like to talk about how beautiful our planet is, but we don't do enough to protect it. As Mahatma Gandhi once said, Earth provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not every man's greed. Instead of being afraid of having sharks in our oceans, we should be afraid of not having them there. Making this documentary was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Looking at all of the cruelty that happens to sharks every single day breaks my heart. And I want to help make a difference in this world. I guess I'll leave it with this. It's not the conservationists versus the fishermen. It's not sharks versus soup. It's sharks versus man. And unless we're able to work together to protect sharks, 
the clock might run out. There is hope. For every person that loves to kill sharks, there's 10,000 others that want to see them protected. Saving sharks can easily be done, but it takes every single one of us to instigate change. And it all comes down to one question. Will you help protect sharks?